that the Prime Minister says the WIC judgment may force amendments to the Native Title Act. Introducing South Australia's new Police Commissioner. And taxpayers to help fund the Garibaldi Directors' Trial. Good evening, Kelly Sloan with ABC News. The federal government has signalled it may be forced to further change the Native Title Act following yesterday's landmark ruling. The High Court found pastoral leases and native title may be able to coexist. John Howard is now calling an urgent meeting of state and territory leaders, but won't indicate whether he'll agree to demands for legislation to extinguish native title on pastoral leases. Such a move already faces Senate opposition, with independent Brian Harradine backing native title rights. 24 hours after the High Court's ruling, John Howard faced the media, a Prime Minister under pressure. It has created a new ball game. He said the WIC judgment reversed government assumptions that pastoral leases extinguish native title, their status to be settled case by case. That could take years and years and years, and I can't think of anything worse to the future investment and development prospects of this country. So yesterday's ruling won't be the last word. John Howard foreshadowing more changes to the Native Title Act. It is the role of the parliament if it thinks fit to change the law. The government is planning urgent talks with state and territory leaders. Their letters of concern already flowing in. Victoria's Jeff Kennett today added to the chorus of premiers and farmers demanding legislation to solve uncertainty. It hasn't covered the High Court in glory and it has left the Australian community at the edge of an abyss. Mr Howard won't preempt how far the government is prepared to go, but any attempt to extinguish native title on pastoral leases faces defeat in the Senate without crucial independent votes. I've always believed that, um, uh, that pastoral leases should not uh, serve to extinguish uh, uh, native title rights absolutely. Opposition too from the Democrats and Greens, saying Parliament shouldn't legislate away people's rights. And while the Labor Party believes there may be room for some amendments, they back the High Court's ruling. That the decision can only be overturned by suspending or overriding the Racial Discrimination Act. And that would constitute a racist response. Senator Harradine believes the question of coexistence should be worked through. The High Court is seeking justice, uh, but it may well have uh, manipulated uh, some precedents in uh, attempting to do so. In the fallout, a call for the Native Title Tribunal's head, Justice Robert French, and his senior staff to resign or be sacked. He's running this hillbilly tribunal. He has to accept the responsibilities for the foul-ups and blunders that have occurred and his head should roll along with others. Senator O'Chee claims Justice French gave dodgy legal advice earlier this year, telling thousands of southwestern Queensland graziers they didn't have to fight a claim because their title was safe. Both the state government and the Farmers' Federation have expressed disappointment at the decision. Attorney General Trevor Griffin says the High Court did not adequately address the uncertainty surrounding native title and it may prove extremely costly to resolve outstanding claims. With a large portion of South Australia already the subject of about 18 native title claims, farmers, Aborigines and the government were hoping the High Court decision would provide a clear path through the minefield. Instead, says the Farmers' Federation, it's reinforced the status quo. And, uh, the uncertainty that, uh, that, that has again been encouraged by yesterday's decision um, is to be lamented. Attorney General Trevor Griffin is similarly disappointed. Uh, the issue has not been clarified uh, in a way in which we thought would be helpful to everybody. Mr Griffin says it's especially unhelpful for mining companies and tourism developers. The the issue of native title does cause significant delays and it also affects their decisions as to whether they'll go ahead with the development or whether they'll go overseas. The South Australian situation is slightly different to other states. For the past hundred years, Aborigines have had right of access to pastoral lease land for hunting and fishing and to conduct ceremonies. Wayne Cornish says this is a significant factor in native title mediations already underway here. But he says it's imperative the Commonwealth reviews the means test for legal aid for landholders who want to contest title claims. We've been um, making representations to the federal government and to uh, the Attorney-General in particular 
to make sure that funding comes through for the respondents to these cases. He says it will be much cheaper for cases to remain with the Native Title Tribunal than going to court, but both sides should be guaranteed equal financial assistance. Victorian Police Officer Malcolm Hyde has been confirmed as South Australia's 20th Police Commissioner. Mr Hyde replaces David Hunt, who's retiring after 13 years as the state's top cop. The new commissioner says he has some ideas for change, but at this stage he's keeping them to himself. 46-year-old Malcolm Hyde grew up in country Victoria, living in police stations manned by his father. Armed with a master's degree in business administration, he rose to the rank of deputy commissioner two years ago. Married with two daughters, Mr Hyde was unanimously chosen by the government selection panel to succeed retiring commissioner David Hunt. But he won't be rushing to turn our force on its head. I have some ideas, but I think it's premature to talk about those. I need to make an assessment of the situation first. Mr Hyde rates South Australia's police force as one of the best in Australasia, but he acknowledges corruption is an ongoing problem in any force. You need to be seeking out uh, misconduct, particularly corruption, and you need to be educating, informing and developing the type of organisation is, that's going to be resilient to corruption. Mr Hyde says his philosophy is based around community policing, partnerships and problem solving. We in policing have to deal with the symptoms and a lot of that is the reactive role of policing. But I am very keen on finding solutions, uh, identifying the causes, putting into place sustainable change. The selection of an outsider has been a sore point with some, but not the government. But most importantly, that they rec recommended to us an Australian. I think that's the most important single issue uh, as far as I'm concerned and, and as far as the government is concerned. The rank and file expressed disappointment a local didn't get the top job, but they'll work with the new man to boost police numbers. Uh, it's a smaller police force today than it was three years ago. We're very concerned about that, and that's a matter we'll be addressing with the new commissioner at the first opportunity. Mr Hyde has signed a five-year contract. He takes over on February 13th. Until then, Assistant Commissioner John Murray will hold the fort after David Hunt retires next week. The Garibaldi trial is set to go ahead following a decision by the state government to fund the defence costs. But taxpayers won't bear the whole burden. The government says it'll seek access to the assets of the three directors. Last Friday, the Supreme Court ruled criminal proceedings against former Garibaldi directors Neville Mead and Philip and Luciano Marchi could not go ahead because the men couldn't afford the legal costs. The three men are charged with the manslaughter of four-year-old Nicky Robinson, whose death was linked to Garibaldi Metworst. Now the state government has agreed to fund the defence costs through the Legal Services Commission. I've made the decision and Cabinet has accepted it that it is in the public interest that persons who are charged with serious offences uh, ultimately uh, stand trial. The government has agreed to pay for the trial on the condition the defendants contribute to the cost. Mr Griffin says the assets of the three directors amount to $180,000, money in their super funds, and Mead will have to contribute half the cost of the family home. Taxpayers will top up the rest, around $500,000. Our view is that before the taxpayers are called upon to make a contribution, uh, uh, the defendants themselves ought to make available assets and funds which they have available. The coroner's inquest cost taxpayers $400,000, Mr Griffin says he'll take whatever steps are needed to keep the trial short and the cost down. The trial is set to start on February the 24th. Two more people have appeared in Adelaide courts over the murder of Tracy Music. Today, two teenage girls, one aged 18, the other 15 years old. Seven people have now been charged in connection with the death of Ms Music, whose body was found tied to a tree at Royal Park 10 days ago. 18-year-old Tara Marie Kehoe was extradited from Geelong yesterday. She made a brief appearance in the Adelaide Magistrates Court. No plea was entered and she was remanded in custody to appear in court again on February the 4th. In the Port Adelaide Youth Court, the last of the juveniles charged with the murder made her first court appearance. The 15-year-old Rosewater girl was escorted to the hearing by her parents. Released on continuing bail, she'll reappear in the Adelaide Youth Court in February. In the Lima Embassy siege, the Marxist rebels are still holding several powerful bargaining chips. Although they freed more than 200 hostages yesterday, the move was seen as a public relations exercise.
The rebels are still holding several influential figures, including six ambassadors. This report compiled by Teresa Chanetsky in Sydney. The Marxist rebels called it a Christmas present to the Peruvian people. The release of about 200 more guests yesterday in a move that surprised negotiators. There was a threat in so much, of course, they were carrying arms, but at no time was anybody mistreated, as far as I'm aware. There is not going to be, I'm sure, a violent or a, a violent solution to this at all, and I, I'm sure that it can be overcome peacefully. But those released had limited connections with the government. Hostages still inside are well connected. They're senior Peruvian officials, ambassadors, international executives, judges and generals at the forefront of the country's anti-terrorism purge. Today they received supplies from the Red Cross. As far as the gunmen are concerned, their number is now more manageable. But Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori is on record as saying he will not negotiate until the rebels lay down their arms. The so-called Christmas gesture has failed to win any concessions from the president. Power and water remain cut off. The rebels now fly their flag with the demand essential services be reconnected. They say the hostages will stay where they are until the government meets their ultimatum the release of more than 300 of their jailed comrades. Boris Yeltsin is back at work at the Kremlin just seven weeks after undergoing heart surgery. And he's vowing to tackle the mounting debt crisis that's left the state virtually bankrupt. The return to duty marks the end of a tough year for the president, as Moscow correspondent Eric Campbell reports. It's the day Boris Yeltsin must have wondered if he'd ever see. Nearly six months after being re-elected, he was finally back at the Kremlin to retake the reins of power. The mood is good and the health is good too. I'm ready for the battle. Yeltsin's office has been empty since he suffered a heart attack during the election. He has tried to rule from hospitals and sanatoriums, but for the most part the country has been run by feuding Kremlin officials. Russia's social and economic woes have worsened, Payments to state workers are as much as six months overdue. The first task is to look into salaries, pensions, problems of the military. Yeltsin's communist rival, who he beat for the presidency last July, was in no mood to welcome him back. Even when he was completely healthy and sober, he didn't resolve a single problem. Yeltsin's return comes on the fifth anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union. Mikhail Gorbachev left the Kremlin on Christmas 1991. He remains as bitter as ever about Yeltsin's role. It was deception. It was a lie. Their whole politics is based on lies. Many hope today marks the end of another period of history when their country floundered without a leader. It's been a particularly trying year. For most Russians, the hope of a normal life is as distant as ever. Doctors have advised Yeltsin to settle in gradually, but say he should be back to full strength within two months. After a year fighting for his own survival, he can now concentrate on saving Russia. Renewed hopes for Middle East peace, with the news that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat are scheduled to meet within the hour. The talks on the Gaza Strip's arrest crossing will attempt to finalise an agreement on the long-delayed Israeli troop withdrawal from Hebron. The talks between Mr Netanyahu and Mr Arafat and their negotiating teams come as a result of intense mediation by United States envoy Dennis Ross. US President Bill Clinton sent the negotiator to try to break an eight-month deadlock. In the past two days, he's met major players in Cairo, Jerusalem and Gaza City. It's hoped the meeting between the two leaders will finally close a deal on the stalled peace process. At this time of the year, the world's Christian focus on Bethlehem is the birthplace of Jesus Christ. But in recent years, Palestinian Christians have been moving out of Bethlehem, leaving a predominantly Muslim population. And the church is worried that if the trend continues, pilgrims to the Holy Land will soon be visiting Christian museums rather than experiencing a living faith. Middle East correspondent James Schofield. Fewer than 40% of people in this West Bank town are Christian now. The majority is Muslim. The exodus of Christians, a process which neither Yasser Arafat nor the Christian church seem able to prevent. Very few families are satisfied with what is happening. And uh, 
I can uh, tell you maybe 60 or 70 percent of the Christians in Bethlehem, if they would have a chance to leave, they would leave tomorrow. Already many have. And even if you discount the claims of an undercurrent of hostility from Muslims, some Christians have come to feel a sense of isolation. Like many others, Jeanette Naimal Yatam and her husband have relatives who've gone to live abroad. She's my cousin, and she left Palestine to live in Australia. Naim is a carpenter by trade. Israeli laws prevent him from going to Jerusalem to sell his carvings made from olive wood, so his goods pile up at home unsold. The phenomenon of young, highly educated people leaving home is nothing new, but here in Bethlehem it has particular significance because on this depends the future of the Christian community in the very birthplace of the Christian faith. It's a concern shared by others. Of course, there is danger that this church uh, mother church uh, will lose really the believers and uh, people from the west will come and visit museums here uh, without having the living community uh, the christian community some sadly contemplate a day when all the christians will have left yeah if they still like this you know if they still living there will be no christians at all bethlehem's christians had hoped that oslo would lead to a more prosperous future Today, that hope has stalled. 17 people have been confirmed dead and there are fears for 21 more in a landslide in Papua New Guinea. Disaster services say the entire village of Wyunda in the highlands, 300 kilometres northwest of Port Moresby, has been buried. The landslide is blamed on days of heavy rain in the area. Queensland scientists are claiming victory in their quest for the perfect prawn for lucrative export markets. They've just developed a prawn which matures faster and grows up to 25% larger than the average raw prawn. After three years, scientists at the CSIRO aquaculture plant south of Brisbane have created a super prawn. It matures three weeks earlier and is 25% larger than a conventionally farmed prawn. The farmer gets uh, both a larger prawn if he wants one for market purposes, but more importantly, he gets a faster growth rate. They're conducting their selective breeding experiments on the Kuruma prawn, a breed that commands the highest price on the world market. Scientists mate the largest male and female crustaceans over the winter season. They also use the growth gene to adjust the life cycle of the prawn. The biggest incentive for this ongoing experiment is the price these prawns can fetch on the Japanese export market. In a peak season, Kuruma prawns can demand as much as $170 per kilo. The faster the prawns mature, the earlier they get to market. Probably about a 25% saving in production costs because he can get a prawn to market in three or four months rather than four or five. So he saved a month's worth of labor, feeding costs, electricity costs in his production cycle. Scientists have been keeping a close watch on the final product with extensive taste testing to ensure the genetically engineered prawn is just as sweet as nature's original. They're also hoping to increase the disease resistance of the prawn as well as enhance its colour. Good idea for Christmas lunch. Education workers, including school services officers, have won a pay rise through enterprise bargaining. They'll receive a 17% increase over two years. Health workers, too, have received a Christmas present from the government, winning a 10% rise over 18 months. To finance now and the Australian stock market witnessed only light trading today in the lead up to Christmas. The All Ordinaries gained less than a point as all sectors wound down. Overseas, the Tokyo market lost ground after selling by retail investors, trading lacked direction on other markets. The Australian dollar remains steady after little movement all week. Banjo Patterson has been given a 90s-style workover. Mark O'Connor, one of Australia's leading poets, has rewritten The Man from Snowy River using contemporary language and including minority groups. But the poet expects a backlash from fans of the original version. Arts reporter Lee Sales. The Man from Snowy River is an Australian icon. The story of a skilled stockman, it's inspired films, TV series and novels. Now the first poetic reworking. I think a lot of people will enjoy comparing the two because the new version brings into the story a lot of elements that have come into our imagination of it since Patterson wrote. Mark O'Connor's version is almost three times the length of the original. It includes greater environmental detail, refers to women and Aborigines and even talks about the squatter's spunky daughter. 
the original's famous opening. There was movement at the station for the word had passed around that the cult from old regret had got away. And the new version with extra detail. So he jumped the stockyard railing in a mood of die or bust and vanished to their horror in a cloud of drumming dust. Literary scholars say the new version won't appeal to all fans of the original. It's a very clever uh, and technically very accomplished poem, but I don't think it has the magic of the Patterson poem, so it's not going to replace it in people's, uh, in people's literary awareness, I don't think. Mark O'Connor says he's already received complaints. While there were predictably people who said you can't meddle with a sacred text, there are others who understood that my version is not there to replace Banjo Patterson's or even to compete with it. It's an additional version. The Bulletin magazine is publishing the new work more than 100 years after it carried Banjo Patterson's original. In the Women's and Children's Hospital this afternoon, a trio of troublemakers spreading some Christmas cheer. There was Toad and Mole. This is Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, Ashley, Ashley, Mr. Mayor. Have you met my friend, Mr. Mayor? Oh, yes, yes. we've all met. And Toad is my, uh, is my nephew. Yes, yeah. we dress alike, don't we? Mine, mine's pretty. I've got, I've got the badge. He hasn't got one. Yeah. The Wind in the Willows characters delighted staff and children with a quick tour of the wards. Mole! I've got run. Mole, come on! Come on, Mole, don't muck me about. Walking too fast, Toad. Right. Mole, you can help me push this if you don't mind. You're not a pack horse. Many of the children will spend tomorrow at the hospital where staff have planned an extra special Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Give us a hug. At the Botanic Gardens, Toad and Mole teamed up with Rat and the rest of the Wind in the Willows cast. Moments like these. Absolutely. The Botanic Gardens will play host to Wind in the Willows in the new year. The wind in the willows is calling to me. The wind in the willows Terrific. A dash across the Tasman and an all-night repair job have put Morning Glory back in contention for line honours in the Sydney to Hobart. The Maxi broke its mast on Saturday, jeopardising its chances of even starting the event. However, a Qantas jumbo was diverted to New Zealand last night to pick up a spare mast. The end of a tense race against time this morning to get the spare mast back in place. It's hotter there. The cargo jet only just managed to land in Sydney minutes before the curfew. The mast then trucked to the city and barged across the harbour at 2am. Well, we helped unload it off the plane at about at, uh, 10.45 last night and sort of followed it through and uh, rigged it. Despite the troubles, the crew remained focused on getting to Hobart first. When something like this happens, it's a setback certainly, but if you let it just throw your whole program out, it can be more of a setback. So... There's still no explanation for the failure of the $400,000 carbon fibre mast. Designer of more traditional yachts, Peter Joubert, warns of the potential dangers with the loads of the new exotic materials not properly understood. Losing a mast is never that disastrous. The hull caving in would allow a boat to sink within one or two minutes. The traditional skipper's briefing today heard how a race record was unlikely with light winds in Bass Strait and with thunderstorms ahead of a southerly cold front pushing up the New South Wales coast. They're the fronts to look out for on Boxing Day. Skippers have also been asked to keep an official lookout for whales following several collisions last year. If you do see whales, slow down if possible. I know it's asking. <laughs> I knew I'd get a laugh out of that. For the first time, a special whale spotting plane will also fly in front of the fleet to warn yachts in danger of a collision. Australian captain Mark Taylor today backed Matthew Hayden as his opening partner for the Boxing Day test and foreshadowed Justin Langer as the number three. Michael Bevan is firming his favourite to be 12th man. A draw will be enough for the Aussies to retain the Sir Frank Worrell trophy. Through the Border and Taylor eras, Australia has boasted a stable top order. But on Boxing Day, the Aussies will welcome their fourth opener in four tests and their second number three. The Australian selectors just looking for, for one of these guys who, you know, they're all good players, just to grab the, grab the opportunity they've been given. And Taylor appears to have settled on his order at the top. Hayden and myself will open up, but the, the number three spot's still up for grabs. I'll have a bit of a think about it. I'm, I'm probably edging towards Langer at three at the moment. Greg Blewett made runs in both innings in the last test, which leaves Bevan or a paceman. Jason Gillespie's injured hand isn't expected to be a problem. 
The West Indies pace attack went through Victoria this week without Kirtley Ambrose, who was resting. His captain was using fighting words prior to a game they must win. I want to buy some gloves for him and see if he can box with unboxing there. He might have a helpful pitch to play his trade. The MCG test wickets of late have provided a lot of bounce. This is a result wicket, which is the way we, we want it to be. Um, so it's only the one out of the seven or one out of the eight that's been a draw. The Warren factor also can't be discounted. Four years ago, he took his first big haul in tests against the West Indies at the MCG. 2-0 down, it's not hard for Santa to work out what to get for Courtney Walsh. My perfect present would be a win in this test match. That's what I'm trying to get from Santa, but he, he didn't pay me any money yesterday. So I've got to go and knock on his door again. He better be early. Santa has a busy night ahead. And Serena Locke joins us now with all the Christmas Day weather details. Good evening, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. We are expecting morning showers tomorrow for Christmas, but it is finding up for Boxing Day. In Adelaide today, the top temperature was 25.3 at 4 o'clock this afternoon, after a low of 12.9 at 6 o'clock this morning. Our photo tonight is morning over Air Peninsula, sent to us by Wendy Spears from Air Peninsula. At 7 o'clock, Adelaide's temperature was 23.7, the bar was steady, the dew point was 9 and we had a relative humidity of 39%. Temperatures across the state were below average in the south and above average in the north today. Maxima ranged from 18 along the southern coasts to 44 at Maree. Turning to our charts now, first our satellite photo, there was a band of middle level cloud over the southern settled areas. It was associated with a trough in the north. It produced a highest gauging of 0.8 of a millimetre at Coles Point on Southern Air Peninsula. It'll continue to produce showers and possible thunderstorms tonight. On the synoptic chart, there's a weak front to the south of the Bight with highs at the east and the west of the continent. They produced southeast to northeast winds today. On the prognostic chart, tomorrow winds are becoming south to southwest in the south with an onshore airstream. We're expecting the high pressure ridge to shift the winds to southeast on Thursday, so that will clear the showers on Boxing Day. For Friday and Saturday, it'll fine up with the ridge staying in the bite and the winds will be southeast. On Boxing Day, for the cricket test in Melbourne, there's some clearing showers and it'll be cool. Looking into state now and a late thundery shower for Sydney, a late storm for Canberra and a cool change in Melbourne. Maxima should range from 24 in Hobart to 42 for Alice Springs. Back in our state, areas of cloud over the settled areas with some showers and isolated thunderstorms. The showers will contract to southern coasts and ranges during the day. It'll continue to be hot in the north. In the country centres, maxima should range from 18 in Mount Gambier to 36 at Lee Creek with some showers in most places. Broken Hill will have a shower or two and 34 degrees. There's a total fire ban for the northeast pastoral district. Fire restrictions are enforced for all other areas and for details, contact the CFS hotlines. The UV risk for the state is extreme tomorrow. On local waters, variable winds at 5 to 10 knots turning southwest early tomorrow and freshening to 12 to 17 knots, seas to 1.5 metres. And for Adelaide, a shower or two to tomorrow morning, excuse me, with a moderate to fresh southwest change, there might be thundery showers tonight. And looking at the next few days, fine for Boxing Day, Tuesday, uh, sorry, Thursday, 22 degrees, for Friday and Saturday, warming up, 26. That's all from me. Have a very Merry Christmas. Back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Serena. Now recapping tonight's main stories. The federal government has signalled it may be forced to further change the Native Title Act following yesterday's landmark High Court ruling. John Howard is now calling an urgent meeting of state and territory leaders. And the state decides the trial of three Garibaldi directors will go ahead, with taxpayers forking out half a million dollars. And that's it for the moment. On behalf of the news team here, may I wish you all a very happy and safe Christmas. Good night. <laughs>